I stay at home with you. 
yours. Shape the <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's panel discussion on the global response to the refugee crisis. This panel is being presented, or this presentation is being organized by Professor Shibli Talhami, who is the Anwar Sadat Chair for Peace and Development. This is a chair that was created approximately 23 years ago to honor president, the former president of Egypt, Awan Sardat. And Shibli Telhamis' job is to do research as well as public education that advances uh, peace and development, primarily in the Middle East, but also in other parts of the world. He will very soon introduce our very distinguished panelists I simply want to say that we are thrilled and we are very, very pleased with the distinguished guests that you bring to this campus and also your research in terms of public opinion poll who helps inform discussions on issues of peace and development. Let me simply say that even though this is the year of immigration, that's a theme for this university, this should be the era of immigration and refugee crisis. And I will simply say I'm looking very much to this discussion and notice that the focus is on the response. We all know that there is a refugee crisis in this country and around the world. Speaking as somebody who is the child of, a refugee, of refugee parents and eventually we came to this country as refugees. All I can say is in my entire life, I have never seen a situation where this country and other liberal democracies have responded with such nativism, isolationism, and populism to this incredible human crisis. And therefore, I'm very eagerly looking forward to this conversation because at issue here is nothing less than the heart and soul of our democracy of the values that we stand for in the midst of this crisis. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you, uh, President Lowe. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I just want to say a few things uh, about this particular event and a few others that are being organized. Uh, this is done uh, in conjunction with uh, the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences. Uh, uh, Dean Greg Ball would have been here, except that he's testifying in Annapolis uh, uh, as we speak. Uh, it is also uh, being uh, co-sponsored by the Office of International Affairs, and Vice President uh, Ross Loin is here. Uh, they worked with us uh, in part because of the year of immigration on campus. Um, I want to, uh, before I introduce my guests and, and start the conversation, moderate the conversation, I also want to say that we have another event that I want you to put on your calendar, and that is April 11th. Um, you know that uh, you heard now from uh, President Lowe uh, that um, uh, you know, he himself is not only an immigrant, but uh, he came from a refugee family. Yeah, he was actually born uh, in, in China, he grew up in Peru, he came to the United States, he's now the president of the University of Maryland. Uh, so we have put a panel together on April 11th called Immigrant Stories, uh, in conjunction with um, the Carnegie Corporation in New York, which has, does a lot of work on uh, immigrants, um, uh, including they have this uh, a program called uh, Great Immigrants every year with the New York Times, they select uh, people uh, for that program, they're co-sponsoring the event. And we have, in addition to, so President Wallace Lowe is not going to be there introducing the event. He's going to be one of the panelists because I want to probe about his story um, as, as a growing up uh, and how he came here, uh, his, the human story. And with him, uh, we have several other people, um, including 
uh, Nina Khrushcheva, who's a, 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 an accomplished uh, professor at the New School, who was the granddaughter of Nikita Khrushchev growing up during the Cuban Missile Crisis. She's now an American with a new book on uh, gold from uh, in, in Putin's uh, footsteps. Uh, we have Maria Otero, um, who was the Under Secretary of State in the Obama administration uh, for human rights, who is um, um, uh, who was born in, in Bolivia, and, and hopefully also uh, Vartan Gregorian, the president of Carnegie, former president of Brown University, uh, who uh, himself was um, born in Iran to an Armenian family, uh, and ultimately ended up uh, here. Um, and we want to probe the stories, the human stories, of uh, immigrants and refugees uh, through that panel. That will be on April 11th. We'll be sending invitation out soon. I hope you'll put that on your uh, calendars. Uh, also, in conjunction with that, I should say uh, that, um, as uh, President Lowe mentioned, um, one mm -hmm. of the things we do is public opinion polling on related issues. Uh, uh, we have this, uh, the U University of Maryland critical issues poll that I direct. Uh, we constantly do polling on some critical issues of the day. At the moment, this week, actually, we're fielding a, a major um, a poll with our partners who are here, Nielsen Scarborough, um, uh, uh, on refugees and immigrants. And in fact, we will have results uh, released about that um, before the next panel. Uh, we will uh, take 10 minutes to, to highlight some of the uh, results from that poll uh, before we start the panel. But let me turn to today, which is really an exceptional panel. Um, we have uh, people who are, I, I consider all of them uh, friends, uh, but they're truly exceptional people. Uh, let me just very briefly uh, give you some highlights uh, of who they are before we start the conversation. Um, first, uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Dina Qawar. Uh, ambassador Qawar has been ambassador of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan to the United States uh, uh, since June 2016. Uh, she also served as the permanent representative of Jordan to the United Nations. In fact, uh, she's led the Jordanian delegation during Jordan, Jordan's non-permanent membership of the UN Security Council and became the first Arab woman ever to preside over the council. So it's really uh, quite an accomplishment. Um, in addition, uh, she was appointed uh, by the president of the General Assembly as a co-facilitator for the high-level meeting of the plenary of the General Assembly on large movements of refugees and immigrants. Uh, um, so obviously, you know, in addition to her personal involvement uh, in Jordan, as Jordan is a, a, a country that deals with, uh, with refugees on large scale, uh, she's had other tasks internationally dealing with refugees. Uh, prior to her position in New York, uh, Ambassador Kawar served as the Ambassador of Jordan to France, uh, and uh, with concurrent accreditation to uh, UNESCO uh, and to the Holy See. Um, also, in recognition of all her accomplishments, she, she received multiple uh, awards uh, internationally. Um, Nancy Lindbergh, uh, another friend, um, uh, is the president of the United States Institute of Peace, and she has been there uh, since 2015. Um, uh, she has spent most of her career working in fragile and conflict-affected um, regions around the world. Uh, so prior to joining USIP, uh, she served as the Assistant Administrator for the Bureau of Democracy, uh, uh, Conflict uh, and Humanitarian Assistance uh, at the USAID. Uh, and she led uh, USAID teams focused on building resilience and democracy, managing and mitigating conflict, and providing urgent humanitarian assistance. She uh, led uh, DCHA teams in response to ongoing Syria crisis, uh, the droughts in Sahel and uh, Horn of Africa, the Arab Spring, the Ebola response, and numerous other global crises. Uh, and I should say, um, before she joined USAID, um, and that's when I really met her in her prior capacity originally, uh, she was uh, president of Mercy Corps. Um, many of you know about the great work that the humanitarian work that they do. She has spent 14 years there helping to bring this uh, terrific organization uh, to prominence. Um, she started her career, um, her international career, working overseas in Kazakhstan and Nepal. Uh, and uh, needless to say, she also has served uh, on multiple boards, and she does multiple boards around uh, the country. Um, 
Finally, um, my good friend, Eric Schwartz. Um, uh, Eric is, um, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you're looking for somebody who's dedicated his life uh, to work on humanitarian issues around the world, uh, this is the man. Um, uh, he has, um, uh, he's currently president of um, a Refugee International since uh, 2011, and I have to say that, uh, just to tell you about this commitment to the issue of refugees, when this opened up, he, uh, he left, um, uh, he was dean at the Humphrey School at the University of Minnesota, uh, and, uh, and he couldn't, uh, you know, he, he had to respond to this calling, uh, taking a leave uh, from Minnesota to, to join uh, Refugee International. Um, he has had a three-decade career focused on humanitarian uh, uh, issues and human rights. Um, uh, he served as the Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees, and Migration, and I uh, contacted him multiple times while he was in that capacity. Uh, he was also a senior human uh, rights and humanitarian official at the National Security Council during the Clinton administration, managing humanitarian responses to crises in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Uh, he also served as the UN Deputy Special Envoy for the tsunami recovery after the 2004 uh, Asian tsunami, and also a Washington Director of Asia Watch, which became ultimately Human Rights Watch Asia. Um, I, I can go on and on and on uh, with all three of them, but I want um, These are really not only quite distinguished uh, panelists, but um, they are um, very much uh, uh, at home with the issues that we're going to discuss. So uh, let me start by saying welcome uh, to all of you, and I'm going to join you, and then we'll start the conversation. Well, thank you again for joining us. Uh, so let me start uh, with a broad question uh, to you, Eric. Um, and the question uh, really is to give, to give us kind of um, the lay of the land uh, on, on this uh, issue that we all know everybody is here, obviously is, is here because they care about this issue. Um, it's something that has uh, been in our discourse, particularly in, in the past few years. Um, um, we know all of the uh, the crisis that um, uh, many countries face, including Jordan, particularly Jordan, I would say, and I'll come back to that later on. But can you give us a little picture about sort of, um, in, in, in global perspective, where the, where the critical issues are, uh, how, how uh, uh, you know, uh, deep is the crisis in comparison to, say, 20 years ago? And I'd love for you to just give us a broad picture on that. Sure, um, and thank you very much. It's a real uh, pleasure to be here, and it's, a, it's a, an honor to be on a panel with such uh, distinguished panelists and, and to be with, uh, with my friend Shibley. Um, well, um, there are uh, now uh, upwards of 70 million people um, around the world who have been forcibly displaced from their homes uh, due to conflict, uh, due to persecution, uh, due to violations of their human rights. And some 25 million of these people are called refugees because they are um, outside their countries of origin and, um, and, and can't really return um, uh, without uh, uh, enduring unacceptable risks. And probably another 40 million or so who are, who are um, uh, uh, internally displaced persons. Uh, the uh, diplomat uh, Richard Holbrook used to call them internal refugees, which is really a contradiction in terms because they're not outside their country, but, but, but um, somehow the word refugees is more compelling than the anodyne term IDPs. Um, and then there are several million others who are in, in places where they're, they're, they're requesting asylum, essentially permanent uh, protection, probably three or four million of those people around the world. Um, added to that are probably on the order of 25 million or so uh, people displaced every year uh, as a result of, of, of um, disasters that are born from natural hazards, hurricanes, um, tsunamis, uh, earthquakes, exacerbated 
by the impact of climate change. Now the numbers, the 70 million number of people forcibly displaced is the, is the largest number since these numbers have been recorded uh, since the end of World War II. Um, and, um, and they come from a relative, the, the, the vast majority come from a relatively small number of countries, countries that are experiencing conflict. Um, and um, and uh, uh, the, um, the, 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 the challenge, the response challenge uh, is a formidable one. Uh, there are, and I'm thinking about four minutes, so I, so I, I don't worry, I won't be going on for 20. Um, so the response channel challenge is a formidable one. And there is a loosely organized international system uh, with the United Nations sort of at the center, uh, but involving non-governmental organizations, national governments that provide assistance to international organizations, many of which are UN affiliated, uh, and, non and, um, and, and national, uh, as I said, national governments. The total amount of international assistance that is used for this huge problem has been estimated on the order of about $27 billion uh, per year. Um, and uh, the United States has traditionally been responsible for about a third, anywhere between a quarter of a th or a third of that total. It seems like a lot. Um, and in absolute numbers, the United States is the largest contributor. But as a percentage of gross national income, we are probably near the bottom of the industrialized uh, uh, global north. Um, now, um, there, the, I, I want to sort of end my remarks on, on, with two points. First, the notion that as difficult as this situation is, uh, it is not hopeless. And there are some, some interesting and important experiments and more underway internationally, all of which accept the notion that no matter how good the world gets at solving the political problems that give rise to humanitarian crises, there will always be refugees, no matter how much better we get. And with that reality, and there will, there will always be refugees, and, and, and the three solutions for refugees, return to their place of, of, of origin when the conditions that motivated their flight go away, um, permanent citizenship in the place to which they have fled, called local integration, or, um, or third country repatriation. They go from the place they fled to a country like the United States that's willing to let them uh, resettle forever. That those three solutions have not been adequate um, to the task. And so there are some interesting and important experiments underway to strengthen those solutions, but also to recognize that refugees in places like Jordan, and I think the ambassador will talk about this, or Uganda, um, or Ethiopia, um, or Turkey, you know, have got, can't be warehoused. The majority of refugees, in fact, are not in camps, but they, but they need real opportunities for education, for work, even if their ultimate status is uncertain. The notion is you've got to build the human capital of people so that they can succeed, even if their status is somewhat uncertain. And there are important efforts around the world taking place to promote these kinds of refugee solutions. And I think I want to end on that sort of high note rather than get into the discussions surrounding the border, which I'm sure we're going to get to. And I'm happy to talk about those as well. But I, I kind of like the idea of ending on this, on, this, uh, on this more aspirational note. The fact that as bad as the situation is around the world, there are governments around the world, there are international organizations like the World Bank, which didn't traditionally do refugee issues but that, that are thinking about solutions for refugees and, and in some cases internally displaced people, solutions in place even in circumstances where the ultimate uh, disposition of the status of these populations may be somewhat uncertain. Well, thanks. I mean, I'll come back to that. I'll push you on that later on. But By I, all means. I, I want to, um, uh, to turn to Nancy and more about you know, the broad question, why do people leave their homes? Uh, uh, and, and sort of what are the causes, what are the drives? And I'm not talking about individuals, I'm talking about the big waves that we witness, that we have. And, and has that changed over time? And I'd like to hear from you about how you see the picture. Sure, and thank you, Shibley, for assembling us. It's wonderful to be here, and congratulations on your year of immigration here at the university. 
very timely, important topic. Um, what's changed uh, is, is I, if I look back over the 20 years plus that I've been doing this, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, 80% of humanitarian assistance went to victims of natural disaster, people who were, you know, floods, droughts, hurricanes, 80%. Well, now, 80% of global humanitarian assistance goes to those who have been forced out of their homes by violent conflict. And if you look at the three top sources of refugees, Afghanistan, Syria, and South Sudan, or if you look at the top 15 sources of refugees, these are all the same countries that are, that are at the top of the list for state fragility. And what we mean by that are countries that have governments that are not responsive to the needs of their people, they are illegitimate, there is a broken contract between the state and its people. Um, these are also the same states that are at the top of the list for sources of violent extremism and the sources where you have civil wars, where you have famines. So the common denominator under all of these global threats to, to peace and stability is really the lack of a responsive state. And if, if you think about the ways in which the global community addresses that, it's very reactive. Humanitarian assistance, although it's still not enough to meet the needs, as Erica said, that's been on a, street, a steep upward trajectory over the last few years, as has funding for peacekeeping, as has the military response that we've done to these global threats. So the challenge is how do we mobilize and how do we organize to work with partners um, addressing this, this core issue of the conditions of fragility. And I just want to quickly note, and I'll take Eric's cue on leaving on a bit of a high note, is that um, U.S. Institute of Peace at the direction of the Congress uh, just completed a task force on looking at how do we better address the sources of extremism in fragile states? How do we understand the conditions within fragile states that give rise to extremism? They're the same conditions that give rise to the kind of violence that pushes people out of their homes. And this bipartisan task force composed of uh, experts and former government officials from diplomacy, defense, development, um, human rights has come up with a series of recommendations. And today, the House and the Senate both dropped legislation on global fragility that calls for the US government to organize in a way that enables us to more effectively address these issues so that we have more of a preventive approach instead of relying so heavily on reaction. Um, that's great, and I appreciate the preventative uh, approach, but I do worry uh, when uh, we have to go to uh, the idea that there's extremism and terrorism to justify our role in addressing what is essentially a big humanitarian crisis. The two go hand in hand. I know it's easier to get money from Congress to address extremism and terrorism instead of humanitarian projects, and we've been there, uh, particularly with the wave of, uh, of uh, after 9-11, with uh, even academic projects started talking about terrorism in every proposal, because you're not gonna get funding otherwise. So I do, I wanna come back to this, because I think um, it's really important to uh, kind of talk about um, the, the, the refugee issue from both terms, both in terms of its, the humanitarian crisis that is really, that poses a moral uh, challenge to all of us uh, that has to be addressed, and obviously then the tie to, uh, to extremism, not only in terms of the same causes that might give rise to refugees or the causes that give rise to extremism, but also whether or not uh, the refugee crisis unaddressed in and of themselves become the seeds of the next uh, wave of conflict and extremism. So clearly, you know, the, the, it goes both ways in terms of cause and in terms of what happens when you don't address it for such a long time. And with that, actually, I'm going to turn to the ambassador because this is really an issue that you have to deal with in a remarkable way. And I say in a remarkable way 
I think most of you know that Jordan is a very small country, and we're talking about under 10 million people. And, um, and we are talking about, if you, if you, uh, you see when we're talking about should we admit a few thousand refugees to the US from all around the world, particularly from the Middle East uh, per year, you're talking about a small country that has absorbed hundreds of thousands of refugees, really millions when you add them all up, beginning with the fact that it's already made up from a large refugee population of the Palestinians, uh, who, who many of whom still remain in refugee camps. But, it, but especially in recent years, since the Iraq war, where you've had um, hundreds of thousands of Iraqi refugees uh, coming to uh, this country next door. And since the, uh, the civil war erupted in Syria, uh, more hundreds of thousands coming uh, to Jordan. So in some ways, uh, Jordan is a country that has enormous challenges uh, in terms of how to uh, provide the humanitarian assistance of work with international partners uh, to provide international assistance to them, but also in terms of how do you deal with the political challenges that arise out of hosting large populations um, who are coming out of conflict and therefore inevitably <coughs> are politicized uh, by virtue of, of the conflict that, uh, that, that, that they, they grow out of. And so um, I would uh, love to hear um, about the Jordanian experience, you know, how, what approach have you taken in, in addressing that? Well, thank you, Shibli, and thank you to President Law for uh, having us here and to my colleagues at, um, uh, at this panel. Um, as you said, the Syrian refugees are around 1.3 million, sorry, uh, refugees to a population that is almost 20% of our population is Syrian. But if we add Palestinian, if we add Iraqi, Yemeni, and other nationalities, we almost have 30% of our population uh, of refugees. Now, Jordan, for those of you, you, you know, but those who don't, it's a country that does not have too many um, natural resources, nor oil, nor gas. Uh, and so it's a country that's struggling to start with economically. And with the uh, Arab Spring, the struggling has increased because the gas pipelines were cut off with Egypt, and so we had to buy our energy resources from the market, which was a big burden on us. And not to mention the unemployment, the closure of, uh, of uh, our borders with Syria, with Iraq, the difficulties economically that would come on jo upon Jordan or any other country in our place. So um, having uh, received 1.3, we decided for humanitarian reasons to keep our borders open for every Syrian that needed to come to Jordan. Now, what we need to know is around only 10% uh, live in, in camps. The rest are in the cities and villages uh, around the country. And so the burden is also uh, difficult because it has uh, affected our infrastructure and uh, in every possible way, including water, which uh, Jordan is the second poorest country in the world in water resources. So this has been difficult. However, the government uh, said, uh, what can we do uh, to deal with this uh, crisis? Of course, we have the international community, we have organizations, the UN that are helping, but it is never enough to cover all the expenses that come out of it. And so uh, as the UN estimates that a refugee is uh, 17 years of his life is outside his country, we figured that 17 years is a big generation. And so for us, the education was something that is major because we did not want to think that any um, uh, generation of Syrian refugees remain without education. So we, at the beginning, we've integrated them in the most difficult situation and circumstances. So teachers were giving classes in the morning and in the afternoon. They were doing double shifts. Uh, classes were going up to 50 students. The quality of education in, in schools in Jordan went really down because we wanted to integrate as many uh, as possible. But with the years, we managed to flip and, and open more schools and give more education. The health uh, was given for free, and already that is difficult. But we had to do it because you cannot leave a whole sector of society. And then we thought, what can we do with a generation of Syrian refugees that do not have jobs? So we decided to turn to foreign labor that was imported into Jordan and take away the, um, and give the permits to Jordanians. So, so far we have 400,000 Syrian students and 120 permits, 1,000 permits for Syrian working. Um, 
this way and this approach of dealing with the Syrians is the first time. It's called the compact. And the compact that we made is with the international community. You help us with your money. You help us to support these refugees. And in return, we will help to try to minimize, uh, because there's never a good life for a refugee, but to minimize the suffering and, and the emergency of whether education or health or jobs. What I need to add to what already was said um, here on the panel is that when we worked on the co-facilitation in the UN, of course, there is the Geneva Convention for Refugees, but there is no convention for migrants. Migrants is another issue. And so, you know, there's a whole uh, 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 part of the UN system that is um, now running to work on the migration issue and try to find the laws and regulations on this issue. Uh, another thing that we uh, we find, you, if you think about this topic, in a funny, strange way, refugees manage to get more help than IDPs because IDPs most of the time are stuck in countries that are in, are in conflict and in failed states. So the difficulty of them being taken care of is not always guarantees, whereas a refugee in the worst of places, he can get a minimum of life. And the third thing that I, uh, I wanted to say, and uh, we're approaching Women's Day tomorrow, is that most of the time refugees and IDPs, the most who suffer in these stories are the women because uh, they are the ones who take over uh, worrying about the children, about the life. And in certain countries, and not in ours, but in certain situations, there is a lot of uh, issues that come up with rape and, and violence and, and mistreatment and all of that that, of course, in Jordan does not exist, but that does exist in other countries. So there is that worry for the women issues uh, in these countries. So. Um, Another thing that we tried through, through the co-facilitation is to say, OK, in the Geneva Convention, uh, neighboring countries are the ones responsible for the refugees, but we cannot go on like that. It is not possible. It's a responsibility of the international community to come in and, and help. And while we accept that it is OK for Jordan to take over and try to uh, integrate these people for the while, but without the help of the international community, we cannot do it. Many times we were found by comments saying, and, and here I stop to, to leave others to talk, is that we have to vet those refugees. We have to make sure they're not terrorists. We have to make sure this. We have, and why don't you take them in? And, and sometimes we in Jordan are surprised and flabbergasted at the fact that uh, the security issue is not for Jordan, but for everybody else. And I need, I need to remind that uh, we are a country with, with our own concerns. Having said that, I must say that for the Syrian refugees, we never saw any refugee that would commit any crime whatsoever or any terrorist act. Well, this is really interesting because in some ways it, uh, it leads me to a follow-up question to Eric because, um, uh, you know, we, 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 uh, the, fear of secu the security fear of refugees, um, that has been uh, certainly true for any country, obviously absorbing refugees but has been really extraordinary here in the US. For example, um, you know, if, if you ask people about uh, those who oppose absorbing more refugees, why they oppose more refugees, the security question is the first answer they give. Uh, when the fear of terrorism or violence or crime is the first thing that they give. Uh, but nonetheless, when you look at it objectively, uh, uh, when you uh, analyze how many the, the refugees have engaged in any kind of, of terrorism, uh, really in, in, in the past 20 years, it's a handful of cases and fewer. Uh, when you ask the public, as we did in our public opinion poll, on how many they think, uh, uh, how, how, how many incidents of terrorism came out of their refugees, you get a large number who exaggerate by far the number of refugee, uh, 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 refugees who committed uh, 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 terrorism or even crime yeah. on our soil. Um, so in, in, in most cases, uh, as we know, including our, our debate about the wall and crime and, and illegal immigrants and crime, uh, the facts are that uh, there, not many are involved, and it's not surprising for a lot of reasons. They want a normal life. They want to be absorbed in the society. They don't want to get in trouble. Uh, and, and, and yet, this is really the stigma. So I want to ask you, Eric, about our own reaction, both in terms of what prior administrations have done uh, 
particularly when you were Assistant Secretary of State for Refugees, working for uh, a, um, a, a, an administration that seemed at least uh, rhetorically and, and probably beyond that more, more accepting of refugees. The numbers still were not very big. Uh, and, um, uh, and now, obviously. So what, what is, how do you assess that? What is the barrier to uh, our ability to absorb more refugees from around the world. We, we, don't, uh, we don't absorb a lot. I mean, again, when you look at the numbers compared to tiny countries like Jordan, or many of the, certainly the neighbor, most refugees go into neighboring countries to be fair, and those are the countries where, where uh, we've seen uh, a lot of the, of the conflict. But it is a question about um, what is this barrier is it, is it just the fear, or is it something else that is uh, preventing our policy from being more accommodating of a large number of refugees? Um, I, I, can I, I want to address that. Can I just comment on two, on two points that the ambassador made also that I think are really sure. important? Um, and, uh, and I'll comment very briefly on them, actually. First, on the Geneva Convention, the definition of a refugee. You know, under, under domestic law, traditionally, uh, you don't get asylum unless you can demonstrate um, severe mistreatment, persecution based on race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a social group. Now, of the 25 million refugees around the world, um, the bulk of them have fled conflict and probably would have a hard time uh, you know, a, a getting asylum based on those narrow criteria. So the fact is, the ambassador's reference to the broader issue of migration and forced migration is critical. Because if, if we don't figure out ways to be receptive to forced migrants who we all agree can't go home, then we're not going to come to grips with this challenge, which is why the solutions experiments that I've alluded to, including those in Jordan, are so important. Um, second, her, the ambassador's points on IDP is exactly right. It's much harder to deal with internally displaced persons, also because governments are very jealous guardians of their own sovereignty. And that makes it a, a, a challenge. And then finally, on women, I just want to credit the government of Jordan because one of the one of the recommendations I have to be a little self-serving here of our last report was Jordanian women in uh, not Jordan, Syrian women in their homes were having trouble registering businesses because they needed a Jordanian partner, and that requirement has been um, has been eliminated. Mm -hmm. And and that was a very good sign. It was one of our recommendations. I don't know if we should take credit for it, but we're very grateful. And it makes a big difference mm -hmm. because, Syrian, uh, because Syrian women were having difficulty getting permission to work. And so it's one of those funny situations where a government is doing the right thing. You're a, an organization going and reporting, and you want to give credit where credit is due, but you also want to prod a little bit. Mm -hmm. So on, on, on Shibley's question, um, uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, you know, um, I think one statistic to me is very compelling, which is uh, since 9-11, uh, since 9-11, uh, we have resettled uh, 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 on the order of a million refugees in the United States. Um, there is not one, there's not one, uh, I, you know, there's not one case of a, re of a resettled refugee uh, in the United States being responsible for an act of terror that led to the loss of an American life. There's not one example. And um, that doesn't mean there'll never be one example. Um, but, you know, evidence-based uh, policy uh, does, not, um, does not characterize our response uh, to this issue. And, um, and um, I give the former administration credit because they made decisions about security screening um, in terms of what the process could be, which would have resulted had, um, had a, a, the election outcome been different in the resettlement of 110,000 refugees in fiscal year 2017. Instead, we're looking at numbers now on the order of 20,000. Now, UNHCR has recognized that for the bulk of the world's population, for the bulk of the world's refugees, third country resettlement, in other words, the resettlement of refugees from places where they're receiving refuge to a third country is not going to be the solution to the vast majority of the world's refugees. But they have said there's probably over a million of the 25 million who should be resettled. And if the United States is prepared to make a commitment of 100, 150,000 a year, and other governments are prepared to make 
uh, concomitant commitments, you could get close to that total. And m my feeling has always been that it's important uh, for us, the United States of America, to demonstrate that we have skin in the game, uh, even if we're not going to be resettling the numbers uh, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are gaining refuge in places like Jordan, uh, Turkey, and other parts of the world. Yes. Yeah, I, I want to uh, uh, carry this theme a little bit more uh, and, and going back to a point that Nancy made earlier um, ab about kind of put aside the politics for a minute. I mean, you, you really shouldn't in a way because everything, the refugee issue is a political issue as well, and I'll come back to that. But uh, just the, the humanitarian crisis itself, um, uh, going beyond... Um, uh, the obvious, the homelessness, the, 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 the need to provide, uh, to go into uh, the things that the ambassador mentioned, uh, particularly vulnerable portions of the population, women and the prevalence of rape in places. We've been he reading a lot about the Rohingya refugee communities recently and the percentage of people who are abused, particularly women and children uh, uh, throughout. So when you look at that, it is interesting to me, uh, as I'm looking at our political discourse, um, how that hasn't captured the imagination. And it is interesting because I have to tell you that one of the questions we ask in our poll uh, is about how people rank the golden rule in their daily priorities. And we find that you know, uh, the majority of all Americans, Republicans, Democrats, uh, independents, say it's a single most important principle in their lives. And we translate that as meaning do, you know, uh, uh, treat others like you want to be treated. Uh, and, uh, and almost 90% uh, say it's, a, it's ranked on the top, you know, like either eight, nine, or 10 on a scale of, of zero to 10 as, as the most important principle in their lives. So the self-perception of people in America is that this is really a driving force in their lives. And so, and yet, obviously, we, we have this juxtaposition with the reality of they've taken positions that are not uh, conducive to it. So how do you get people, when, you, when you're looking for remedies or looking to get budgets or looking to, to, uh, for, for mechanism to address it, uh, looking for strategies to be effective, how do you deal with that? Well, I think you're absolutely right that that is an overwhelming impulse, uh, certainly within the American public. And in fact, our humanitarian budgets have remained quite healthy and have increased substantially over the last four to five years as this crisis has escalated. Um, I, w I would make two points. One is that one of the problems is, and the ambassador mentioned this, given that people are displaced longer. They are, on average, refugees longer than they used to be. Um, so, you know, the, there are different ways to understand the statistics, but somewhere between 11 and 17 years is, has become more of the average. We need to rethink how we provide assistance. And so the traditional humanitarian assistance of here's shelter, food, water, is not what is needed. And what instead is more of a developmental approach where you're providing access to work. Um, really importantly, education. Because if you look at the refugee, just the refugee population, some 40% of them, or I think it's over 50%, are children. They're under the age of 18. And if you are a refugee for that long, that's, that's your whole growing up. And if you don't have access to education, um, that creates a whole secondary set of problems. And there's well, well known research as well about the impact of conflict, social exclusion on your brain, especially on a younger brain, what's called toxic stress, that has long term ramifications as you move into adulthood. So we need to. It's not enough mm -hmm. to do humanitarian assistance. It's both a different kind of humanitarian assistance and as both Eric and the ambassador have mentioned, the kind of policies mm -hmm. that enable refugees to work and have access to education, which are a big burden on the majority of the countries that have the largest refugee populations. So then you need to provide additional assistance to those countries to help them provide the kind of assistance that they need. 
It was, it's interesting, just this week, Pakistan announced that for the first time in 40 years, that Afghan refugees were able to open a bank account and have access to uh, the, the formal work sector. That's after 40 years that some of these folks have been displaced in Afghanistan. So it's, I, I actually think it's, the, the generosity is there for the assistance. It's a different conversation for what Eric was talking about, about resettlement. But we have to rethink how we provide assistance, particularly as we have people who are displaced for, long, for longer periods with ever younger populations. Uh, yeah, and that, that makes a lot of sense, and, and I think um, an important point to make. But going back to that point about resettlement versus humanitarian aid, while our aid has increased, um, we obviously have taken fewer refugees. And it's interesting because um, going back to this point about the golden rule, uh, during the election campaign, uh, the presidential election campaign in two 2015 and 2016, I don't know if you recall, that's when uh, the uh, Republican candidates took an anti-immigration uh, position that uh, uh, pushed, uh, and including ones who were supported by evangelical Christians on the right, to the point that a limited number of evangelical Christians said, no, no, we need to be a little bit, uh, you know, sort of more uh, friendly to uh, communities in need, not, not overall. So what was interesting is that the leading candidate among evangelicals at that time was not Donald Trump, it was Ben Carson. And Ben Carson, feeling the heat on this issue, actually flew to Jordan uh, uh, to take pictures with refugees mm -hmm. to show that he cared, but he didn't want them to come to the U.S. Mm -hmm. As long as we helped them there, he didn't want to take refugees into the U.S. That's kind of the way people deal with this dissonance is let's help them out there, but we don't want them here. And I think this is kind of an issue that, that we have to unpack. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I guess I, I should comment on, on that. Um, first of all, I think the ambassador has discussed this, I have discussed this, Nancy has discussed this. I think it's important for everyone to appreciate that, that, that um, conceptually there has been, I think, um, uh, an evolution, a significant evolution, which is, the and, and I'm gonna grossly generalize, but traditionally the thought was Refugees flee, you gotta kinda take care of them, and then they come back to their countries of origin when the situation gets resolved. And, 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 and we all understand that's not how it works. That, that's, and we all understand that as, in, as important it is for us to deal with root causes, because everyone also understands Sadaka Ogata, uh, the uh, former uh, UN High Commissioner, said there are no humanitarian solutions to humanitarian problems, and she's right. They're political, they're political solutions. But the conceptual breakthrough, I think, that was really significant, and we've all been talking about, is there are always gonna be refugees. And so if we don't figure out ways to, make, to help, make, help refugees make their own lives meaningful with education, with some sense of, of security, with some sense, then, 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 then we're, 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 never gonna see, we're never gonna make progress. And that's why when, when the, when the ambassador talks about education, when Nancy talks about developmental solutions, that conversation is taking place, mm. and it's significant, and, it's, and, it, and the World Bank is involved. We think of the World Bank as a development agency. So all, and, that, and that's what's happening. The issue that Shibley raises is a tougher one. Um, in, 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 in the United States, until 2015, there was a broad bipartisan consensus about in the importance of refugee assistance overseas, humanitarian assistance overseas, and the value of refugee resettlement and refugee admissions. Um, with the Syria crisis, um, that, that, that consensus began to break down. And now, and I work for a nonpartisan organization, but I don't think that deprives me of making an analytical comment about bipartisanship. And right now, it is almost impossible, almost impossible, to find a Republican member of the House or Senate to stand up and speak on behalf of the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. Nearly every Republican senator, um, I think every Republican senator, and I don't remember whether there was a vote in the, in the Congress, 
voted uh, for legislation that would have effectively have shut down the refugee admissions program because it would have required um, uh, um, senior U.S. officials to make a declaration that the entry of particular refugees would not pose national security risks. And that would have effectively shut down the program because no senior American official would have made that declaration. So, so that's, the, that's the political reality that we're in now. And, um, and, um, and, and it's a challenge. It's a challenge because um, the, the, the consensus on behalf of policies of tolerance, of inclusion, of, 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 of protecting the stranger, um, that consensus, which Americans is part of our self-identity, has always been a terribly fragile one. Whether it was American support for know-nothingism in the 19th century, uh, support for the anti-Semitic rants of Father Coughlin in the early part of the 20th century, um, the, the fact that most Americans did not want Vietnamese to resettle in the United States, did not want Kosovars to resettle in the United States, um, the difference has always been uh, political leadership, leaders who are prepared mm -hmm. to bring the public along. And we're not in that situation. Um, uh, without making any ad hominem comments, you know, our president has articulated perspectives that are antithetical to the perspectives of refugee inclusion and support. So we have a challenge. We have a challenge. And, um, and that's what Shibley's asking us about. Yeah, and, and I, I just to, to, to add to this uh, question of political leadership, uh, we actually did some empirical research on that in the polling. The previous poll, I believe I did that with my colleague Steve Cull, who's sitting here. Uh, we did a couple of years ago um, a, a uh, uh, kind of a trying to see uh, how people estimate how many uh, refugees we should accept. And that number was heavily influenced by the messaging they were getting from the president. And it didn't matter whether they were Republican or independent because that sets the tone because people have no starting point. They might disagree with it a little bit up or down. Uh, the messaging is always uh, uh, central for the way people make up their mind on that. Um, I wanna ask the ambassador a related question and then I wanna ask one question to all three of you uh, and then I'm gonna go to the floor. Uh, those of you who have questions, we have two microphones. Uh, uh, on each side and uh, feel free to uh, ask questions uh, of the panelists. Um, the question I want to ask you is really about this um, remedy, which on the face of it makes sense. That is, we really should do developmental kind of aid that sustains people over time. It's not just uh, uh, you know, bandage uh, help. Uh, and, and obviously it makes a lot of sense. Education is a big part of it. Um, economic em employment is a big part of it, um, all of that. But there is a bigger elephant in the room because uh, we are not just talking about, uh, we, you know, so we don't want to, countries don't want to sustain refugee communities in their societies. And these are people who are theoretically came in temporarily. They're absorbed because they, they're temporarily. And they, they influence the, the balance within these countries dramatically, often some kind of demographic balance. Uh, and they influence politics. And they come out of conflicts um, uh, that have mobilized them. That, that's why usually they become homeless, because if you're a Syrian refugee, you're escaping what happened in Syria. And you don't, you, you're not gonna divorce yourself from what's happening in Syria. How could you? You just lost your home over it. So you're politicized, and you're politicized in a way that sure is, uh, you know, is, is not really directed at the host country, but it's ultimately destabilizing for the host country. And so um, can this developmental aid um, be decoupled from the bigger question of how do we address the political picture? How do we, how do we think about the resettlement, not just sort of sustainment of refugee communities. Um, and you have a lot of experience with that because all of your communities have had ongoing conflict in their countries. I think there is, uh, there is need to see clarity because the discussions about refugees is becoming so politicized that everybody's not seeing the day of light and it's become a zero sum game 
we like them or we like them not. We don't want them, we want them. The clarity of the, of the issue is as follows. There are two types. There's the refugees and there's the migrants. In the United States, you have the issue of migration more than refugees because much, much of the time they're coming for economic um, <coughs> security. And so this has to be dealt with in one way, whereas the refugees fleeing from conflict is another issue. This is an emergency that you need to you know, put off the fire and you need to deal with it. We saw that the refugees, uh, the Syrian refugees who did go and flee uh, through Turkey to Europe, we saw the result, uh, the, the popular governments that came because uh, of their they were scared uh, from these refugees, not to mention that many of them were having Afghanistan, from Afghanistan and other countries, what we identify as migrants. They were going also for economic uh, opportunities. So the confusion around this came, became that we have uh, the Brexit, the fear of refugees, the fear of Islam, which already in Europe is becoming something uh, also very strange and confused. And so uh, these, the, the uh, refugees is not about money and worried that they will eat our food and, and drinks and use, it's all about the identity. You look at Europe, the, the worry became about the identity. Europe is a rich country, is a rich continent, and Germany, in fact, needed labor, if you look at that. But it was the identity of who is coming into our country. It's the same in the United States. There's this fear, and it's being utilized. So I think, personally, we need to just take a, a, a breath and think for the uh, uh, political issues, uh, like uh, you said, we need to go to political uh, solutions and try to find political, but while we are finding political solutions, we need to make sure that these people are kept like somebody who gives you a, something to take care of and then you bring back to your country in better hands. You're not going to bring back a whole generation to Syria who have had no education and no work and, and no health. That's one thing. But for the migration, yes, there is a discussion to be taken. How much do we give in development aid? Yeah. Do we stop development aid or we don't? Is it useless? Is it not something that we need to work on? Is it better to have development aid in neighboring countries that are poorer rather than make sure? So these are political issues that need quietness. And unfortunately, right now, the discussion is not quiet and it's not intelligent. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, you know, with that regard, it's, it's, it's um, when you, when you look at some of the, uh, one of the facts that Nancy put on the table about how it used to be that um, the, uh, most of the refugees were more economic refugees and now 80% are really war, come out of war companies. Na natural disaster. They natural were, disaster. Were, but that's Na not yeah. refugees, just humanitarian right. assistance. Humanitarian altogether, that's not just refugees. Yeah. The numbers you gave, the 80%. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but still the conflict is obviously now is the driving. Refugees that's, and the that's internally what, uh, displaced. And, and that just relates to uh, the, the, the complexity of dealing with it beyond the humanitarian. I want to put a, um, a final basket of issues on the table for all of you. Um, and again, those of you who want to ask after that, please feel free uh, to do so. Um, uh, I, I want to do it for the region that uh, I uh, write about, the, the Middle East. Um, and. Um, uh, particularly with regard to the Trump administration. The Trump administration, we know, has been taking a tough uh, stance on all these issues globally, not just the Middle East, but the Middle East um, it clearly has been a big issue. Remember, we had a, a ban that was not quite a Muslim ban, but it was a Muslim ban. And in fact, in some of the polling that we have done about the degree to which Americans are receptive to accepting refugees, we give them different regions. Uh, Europe, Africa, Latin America, uh, Asia, the Middle East, uh, they're least receptive to people from the Middle East because of this discourse that we have had and, and the fear uh, that is linked to, to that region. And no question about that. But we do know that even aside from the broad policy of, um, of, of the administration toward refugees and, and immigrants, uh, they've had a specific policy that's related just to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that has had a dramatic impact on refugees, and that is, in this particular case, the cutting aid to, uh, to um, the UN agency that administers aid to the, Pal uh, to the Palestinians, uh, UNRWA. And I have, for full disclosure, uh, I serve on uh, the board of UNRWA USA. Uh, 
So uh, I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm uh, going to put that out there in terms of, of, of um, uh, engaging in this particular uh, discourse. Um, so with, with um, um, uh, what you're observing, uh, uh, Eric, um, uh, not just in terms of how you, you followed before what uh, other UN aid uh, agencies do vis-a-vis, -vis, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian uh, refugees, uh, millions of them, including some in Jordan, uh, but many in Gaza, many in the West Bank, many certainly more even in Lebanon and Syria. Uh, and who's doing that work? Um, uh, uh, and tied to that, um, you have released a, a really important report. I was very impressed with the quality that came out of it uh, a few months surprised ago. Surprised? Uh, <laughs> I said I was very impressed. I didn't say I was surprised. Uh, uh, and, and that was on Gaza, uh, which is a tough issue. Uh, and the humanitarian situation in Gaza, uh, particularly now in light of uh, this development, uh, so, um, can you talk about that a little sure. bit? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, re refugees are, and, and you know, when, when forced migration is connected to humanitarianism, right? Because people have to flee, um, usually because of conflict, persecution, uh, disasters born by natural hazards. And, and the field of humanitarianism is a field that deals with the issue of forced migrants and refugees, but also deals with um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, victims, even victims, victims in place and victims on the move. Um, uh, for decades, um, for many decades, uh, the international um, uh, organization that has had responsibility for providing assistance uh, to Palestinians uh, displaced, um, as a result of conflict in the Middle East, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, um, the, that agency has been the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees in the Near East, and that's an organization that has been that was assigned by the international community, governments of the world, to take responsibility. For years, um, uh, for years, uh, the United States has been uh, UNRWA's largest uh, a country donor. It got to the point where the United States was giving, I believe, more than $350 million a year at last count. Um, and by all reports, UNRWA has done a good job um, uh, in providing this assistance. Um, uh, beginning, I guess, over a year ago, uh, the president uh, started to uh, express the view that um, the Palestinian leadership, because the Palestinian leadership was not uh, taking positions consonant with, consistent with U.S. policy objectives, um, aid to the Palestinians, including humanitarian aid, was going to be cut off. Um, and then the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, when asked directly by a journalist about the president's statement as it relates to UNRWA, um, the uh, ambassador Haley confirmed that. Essentially that we're going to stop aid to Palestinian civilians because we don't like the positions that are being taken by the Palestinian political leadership. Now, in international humanitarianism, every, every, every uh, discipline has its theology and its, and its doctrine. And in international humanitarianism, we have the, the, the principles of impartiality, aid based on need, uh, neutrality, that the aid deliverer doesn't take a position in the conflict, uh, independence, that that aid is independent of political objectives and, 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 and governments, uh, and humanity, the idea that, that people suffering anywhere in the world are worthy of our attention and concern. So when the, when the president made this announcement and Nikki Haley confirmed it, and then the United States subsequently cut off all aid to UNRWA, you know, our organization's view was that was abhorrent, that was inconsistent with principles of humanitarianism that the United States had endorsed for decades. It was unacceptable, it was outrageous. I don't know what other adjectives I could attach to it, um, but it was just plain wrong. Now, subsequently, the administration developed some post hoc rationales that UNRWA isn't, isn't doing the job it should be doing, et cetera, but those were all post hoc rationales. Uh, the, the, the reason for the decision was clear and apparent, and it was violative of humanitarian principles. I also happen to believe very strongly 
then UNRWA has done a good job. And if the administration knew its best interests, and here I'll take off my humanitarian hat and put on a national security hat and say that it is, it is, um, it is stupid national security policy to cut off aid to UNRWA because then there are um, other uh, um, influences in the region served by UNRWA which are more antithetical to American foreign policy interests. So the decision was wrong on so many different levels, it's really hard to, you know, to, 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 um, uh, to capture it in only five minutes. But, but, but the question the, the, related to that, I mean, you have looked, I mean, one of the things about your report is you looked at Gaza humanitarian crisis, right. uh, even, even aside from the UNRWA crisis, and how, how uh, it was a, quite a bleak picture that you a ter Yes, I mean, a, you know, a, 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 a terribly bleak situation. And, and our conclusion uh, was that the, the cutoff of assistance was, gonna, was going to have, you know, dramatic and negative effects on the well-being and the lives of the people in Gaza. And, um, and we have argued and are continuing to argue that those, those cuts are having um, significant and substantial impacts on well-being, not only in Gaza, where I think the impact is probably the greatest, but in other, in other parts of, 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 of the Middle East where there are Palestinian refugees who are served um, by UNRWA. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, I discussed this at, at, a, at, a, at a congressional hearing a few days ago, um, and I, my own recommendation is the Congress should earmark funds for UNRWA. Uh, whether that's going to happen is a different is a different story, but I think it's very unfortunate. And so, a final related question to both of you, um, which is about uh, put aside uh, the the political situation of Trump for Democrats, Republicans, you know, analytically, uh, there is an argument to be made that um, an organization like ONRO, any uh, organization that is providing, uh, uh, is institutionalizing the refugee situation. Uh, without putting forth, uh, without creating incentives for uh, needed political solutions, that that somehow it is it is postponing by virtue of uh, uh, you know creating normalcy in daily lives of something that is really not normal, even with all the aid that you provide. Uh, and um, how do we how how do you deal with that analytically? Well, I I would just make two simple points. The first is to, you know, triple underscore what's been said that all of these issues are fundamentally political and that if there isn't the attention and, and the focus, uh, people are in limbo and stranded for generations. And there's no, there's never going to be a, a humanitarian solution. Having said that, the second is you cannot leave people stranded yeah. without not just life-saving assistance, but the kind of education and employment that we've all talked about, because otherwise you just create generations um, that are disaffected, that have the kind of grievances that lead to further disruptions and cycles of potential violence. It's a, it's a deep injustice to, to the, the families and the communities, and it's a terrible disservice to the countries, both at their sheltering in and that they would eventually return to. There's got to be that ability to live with dignity even in that moment of crisis. And so it's, it's both the humane thing to do and it's also the right national security approach. Yeah. Great point, but Ambassador. To answer you, if, if the opposite of not creating a refugee, eternally refugee situation is solving the refugee situation, I'm with you. But if it is to make it disappear under the carpet, then what's the use? Mm -hmm. I would add also that uh, what few people know is that the um, security apparatus in Israel did not like the decision. Now, it may come as a surprise to many of you, but it does because the security apparatus in Israel is concerned with the security issues in Israel. And they say, what are we going to do with all these Palestinians if they don't have education and free access to clinics? Think about it. That is a problem for, for them. So um, the debate seems not to be lost uh, uh, only <laughs> here, but over there as well. And I think that the political you know, 
prioritizing is more uh, for electoral reasons than for uh, trying to solve the problem. So this is very unfortunate. We have uh, said to the administration that it would not be a wise thing to do. We said it in all good faith and because we consider ourselves to be allies and friends of the United States. We also said that the United States maybe has been giving too much money to this agency more than others who do have the means, but that can be solved. And if it's an issue of money, we should work on it that way. But I, we've tried our best every year to try to get the funding last minute. And, in, and even one year, we have uh, uh, postponed our school year uh, uh, one week ahead so that we get the funding for the UNRWA because we did not want UNRWA students to be f left behind. Well, thanks so much. So um, we'll take a couple of uh, questions from the floor. Um, uh, please come to the podium and ask, uh, ask your question. Uh, please go ahead, be the first here. Hi. Introduce I'm, yourself, oh, please. Sorry. Uh, my name is Ella Jacobs. I'm a student. I'm a sophomore at James Huber Blake High School, and hopefully a future international relations major here. <laughs> Great. We'd love um, to have you. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the university for championing the struggles of asylum seekers by facilitating this conversation. My question is, how can ordinary people influence legislation, pro-immigration legislation in our country, and how can we stop viewing re um, refugees as a statistic and start seeing them as people? Thanks very much, and, and I think anyone who wants to take that um, uh, would, would be good. I mean. Well, I would just say on any issue, if you want to influence it, don't be afraid of being in touch with your members of Congress. They really do listen to your voices, and that's important. And I'm sure Shibley can say something about the April event that's coming up in order, of, in order to tell the stories that are powerful and create the human profile. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I described that already, but... Uh, but Eric, what about, you know, from, from, from a policy point of view, you sat there as Assistant Secretary of State dealing with some of those issues. Yeah, look, I, I would echo what, what Nancy said about the, 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 but about the uh, uh, politics and political influence um, and, and engaging with your members of Congress. But I, I think you, your question, you kind of answered your question in the sense that um, when you made reference, I can't remember what Appreciate phrase you used, but, but the key in terms of changing perceptions, I believe, uh, in the absence of political leadership, um, uh, is um, contact and communication. It's contact and communication. Because when communities, when individuals, see that there are refugees and immigrants in their communities, um, that is so much more powerful than statistics that say if Midwestern states don't increase immigration you know, several fold, their labor force, is, you know, their children are gonna be emigrating from Midwestern states. It's more effective than saying you know, refugees commit crimes at lower rates and immigrants at lower rates than native born Americans. All those statistics are true, but ultimately they're not as meaningful as contact and communication. And so if you're a, you know, and, and it's actually more important in places where there aren't a lot of refugees and immigrants than in places like where we live. Uh, because statistics have demonstrated that where, where you have high numbers of refugees and immigrants, you know, they're, 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 there's, there's great tolerance and support. Where refugee numbers and immigrant numbers have gone from, say, 0.5% to 3%, that's where the level of fear and concern becomes the greatest. Because people perceive that there's been a change and they're not and they don't have that contact and communication. So whether that means organizing, you know, uh, community suppers where you where people native born Americans can can meet with refugees. I don't know. It's that kind of contact and communication which makes a difference. And Thank maybe you, yeah, and maybe I would add one thing that uh, we rarely look at is what uh, positive additions these people add to any economy or community. We hardly <coughs> talk about that. So it's important. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, also in, in public opinion polling, we did research, it confirmed certainly the, the point that Eric made about, um, you know, when people know someone, it's, it transforms. It's, it's not because, people, you know, refugees are great. I mean, some are great, some are not. 
it's just it normalizes it, and, and people look at them. Uh, we see uh, how attitudes shift uh, with that. And, and uh, with regard to the stories, uh, Nancy, you're right. I mean, that's the idea, of course, of having this April 11th uh, story, because a lot of the people, I mean, it's like the discourse about refugees is like us and them, when in fact we're all, we're all somewhat refugees or immigrants, many of us, if not us, our uh, parents and so forth. And that's the thing is like it's the other when in fact it's us, it's America. And that's the thing that I think has to be, uh, people have to be reminded that many of the great people they admire, many of the people who contributed so much to this country, many of the people who made this country great, many of the people who made this country great are refugees and immigrants. And that's, that's what we really have to uh, remind ourselves. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I, my name's Linda Rabin. I'm a faculty member in the anthropology department and I work on migration. Uh, you've partly answered my question. Uh, we all here are members of the university community and we're having this year of immigration I would say we can't stop with one year of immigration. We've got to keep doing this. It has to become one of the priorities for the university. But uh, how would you members of the panel suggest that we members of this university community can act to uh, advance the cause of refugees and other migrants? Um, th that's a great question. And I have to say just to, to, uh, that before we came here on the stage, we were having that conversation uh, with President Lowe, who was, uh, who was uh, uh, here in the, in the private room, and he said, this is not the year of immigration, this is the age of immigration. And, and sure, I, I think that's that bigger point, uh, but I'm not sure, you know, I, I mean, there are many ideas that one can propose. Uh, I, I know there are a lot of ideas that are uh, already uh, being considered, uh, if you look at the programming, but it's something, it's a conversation we shouldn't drop. This is just intended to highlight it, but keep it uh, ongoing. And yes, next, and then on this side. Hi, my name's Shivani Shah, and I'm a junior undergraduate student uh, here at UMD. I started an organization on campus that does a lot of work with refugees um, in PG County. Um, and I actually met with Dr. Rabin uh, last week, and we talked about how Something that we notice is that there's a lot of professional refugees coming in to this country, very highly skilled people, yet their knowledge is going completely to waste because there's no streamlined way of their knowledge to be harnessed. Um, there's a lot of language barriers and uh, bureaucratic processes in the way. So I was wondering if you foresee any solutions to that in the future because that could be something very useful to this country. Yes. Uh it's a it's a terrific question, and um, it's a terrific question. And um, uh, on the one hand, um, the, the 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 unacceptable response, but it's but it's not it's not completely irrelevant, um, or is that it's a big problem, but you know highly skilled refugees who have pro professional credentials come here and they can't engage in those kinds of activities, but they do okay. You know, they 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 they, they do it for in a, in a variety of ways. That's the unacceptable answer, but it's important to make that point. Um, the 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 challenge is um, uh, licensure uh, is is very much state by state, and and so it's a really tough nut to crack. And I've you know, and I never plumbed the depths um, uh, on it when I was Assistant Secretary of State. But I've often wondered whether there could be some sort of federal legislation that, that, um, you know, that would respect principles of federalism under the Constitution, but would ease, um, uh, um, you know, that, that, could, that, that would ease um, uh, licensing uh, transitions or might, um, or might provide funds for, um, for support for uh, uh, those kinds of transitions or might promote some uniform standards that states could then adopt. I think it's a really important area. And uh, unfortunately, it would be a much more significant issue if we were resettling more refugees right now. But, but um, I think all I've succeeded in doing is uh, affirming your, your point that it's an important issue. 
But, yeah, no, but can I just add on, emphasize something that Eric said, mm -hmm. and that is the reality is refugees who get resettled to third countries like Europe and the US are the really lucky ones. Who is the most vulnerable in these conflict situations are those who never even get to cross the border. They have the fewest resources, the least education, are usually the poorest in their countries. And that's why the commentary about the internally displaced people in these conflicts is, is, is important not to forget mm -hmm. that of the 78 million, sorry, the 68 to 70 million people who are displaced globally right now, um, the majority of them are still internally displaced. Yes. And may I add a word just for uh, that category of refugees who finish school and are not able to finish their higher education? What a waste, you know, these people who <laughs> go to universities. And, and many times I used to reach out to universities and say, why don't you do one chair for one refugee or one, choose the good one. I mean, nobody's asking you to lower any standard, but among those you're talking about, there are many good. And it's just complications and hurdles everywhere, which doesn't make sense for me. Uh, I'm gonna take the last two questions together and that'll be, uh, and then we'll get one round of answers. So, um, I think uh, you, uh, no, you are next and then you, yeah, okay. and introduce yourselves. Hi, my name is Sylvia Cedric and I'm a first year at the School of Public Policy graduate student. Thank you for your time and comments and your service to this vulnerable population. Um, Ambassador Kapoor, you mentioned the vulnerable population of women in, in this conversation. Um, and on, on the flip side, I think women can often also be a multiplier in how they allocate resources within the family and not putting themselves first but the children. Um, so it's easy to kind of imagine this on a greater level of how can empowering women affect the greater uh, refugee crisis in supporting that on a larger scale through empowering women. Um, so I'm curious if you have any thoughts regarding that in terms of policies and how to um, kind of deal with the refugee crisis through the empowerment of women. Great, let's take the, the next question and then we'll answer them together. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm a, um, from the University of um, Johns Hopkins University, PhD student. I work on immigration and uh, refugees. My question is uh, more related to uh, resettlement, so post-immediate assistance to refugees, and uh, more applicable to maybe uh, the global north, um, Europe, North America, Australia. Um, just a couple of um, questions in terms of accepting that um, assistance like UNRWA is important and not dismissing that, of course. Um, in, in addition to that, um, I guess a lot of uh, policies of re pertaining to refugees work within the framework of normal, just typical migration for economic growth and filling the gap due to um, you know, reducing population, etc. Um, how can that be um, not, not, not meeting the needs of refugees resettling in um, diverse countries uh, where the policy is really driven by the economic interest, uh, which is legitimate of course, but that's kind of where the, um, the bulk of the policy comes from. And the second thing is with regards to organizations that work on the ground with refugees uh, in resettlement countries, um, <coughs> With, um, again, accepting how well-intentioned they are, uh, a lot of the times the work they do kind of cements and fixes refugees in the victim's role and does not allow them to uh, kind of transcend that and just keeps them in that, kind of fixes them in that identity. Um, so have you come across that a lot in your work and what kind of uh, have you offered to that? Thanks. Um, so let's go uh, in the opposite direction this time. We'll start with the ambassador. Uh, since, especially since there was a question yeah. directed at you. I, I, uh, I'll yeah. answer the question about women. Definitely at the beginning of the crisis, there was, you know, as every crisis, there's a, a time for adjustment and uh, uh, to have an answer to any issue. And at the very beginning, you could see um, stories, sad stories concerning the women, a part in which families would marry off their, their gods early on and uh, then they would go and get pregnant and come back divorced and then, you know, child marriage and all of that, which child marriage does not exist in Jordan because we have our, uh, our laws on that. But as with time, uh, there is, uh, the awareness came in and, and the Jordanian community went out with the NGOs to make campaigns to try to... Uh, <coughs> <are you> okay? <laughs> 
to try to uh, no no to try to um, bring awareness on that issue. But but uh, women participation to the economy is now starting uh, with many NGOs, local and others, uh, in which they work. Whether it's cooking, preparing food, selling. Uh, sewing, I mean, you're talking about the older generation maybe that have their, but for the younger, there's so many young women who've discovered talents uh, thanks to many of the NGOs who came in and, and opened shops in, in, for either uh, some kind of drama, there's even one who's doing film and others. So um, the, the strange thing about this whole human tragedy is that you have uh, those who have discovered new talents and new ways of being independent and on their, on their feet that the, the tragedy has given them. So at least that, uh, whereas others got stuck. But, but definitely there's a big, big work for, for women to work from their home or small shops and, and, and that has been wonderful. About the issue that you said, you know, for refugees remaining as the victims, uh, definitely I agree with you. It's very important that they don't. And one of the issues that we, um, in Jordan, try to avoid is that for the camps to become a visiting area. We hate it. We hate when people come to see the camps and walk around and look at the refugees as if they're, they're in a zoo. <laughs> but, in, and um, I think they hate it too, because there's always, the, you know, they have to be taking photos with, with the incoming. And, and, and we try to limit that only to when it is necessary, because, uh, you know, one thing we've talked about and we've mentioned the most important about Thing about refugees is their dignity because you can stay for days without food but dignity is important and it has to be kept into into our minds because uh, parents who are dig feeling the dignity that they can uh, raise their kids uh, to become healthy kids whereas if they feel they've lost it then they cannot even transmit that to to their children uh, last words Nancy and then uh, Eric I'll try, and apologies for my coughing, everybody. <clears throat> I, I, I just want to make two quick points. One is, I went to Jordan quite a lot during the several years of the Syrian crisis. And on the issue of women, um, how we provide assistance is really critical to the point of dignity. So the, in 2012, we were, the international community was providing bulk food that women had to line up to collect on a bi-weekly basis. <clears throat> it's very humiliating to have to do that. A year later, they were able to uh, get cash vouchers and take those cash vouchers to participating supermarkets. Two years later, they were given credit cards that they could go to ATMs, load up cash, and go and buy like a, any Jordanian at the supermarket what groceries they wanted. And it gave such an increased sense of dignity, of personal choice, and they were able to communicate, these women were able to communicate it back to their children and have a sense that there was greater normalcy to their life. And so, you know, I think the assistance that we provide has continued to move forward in a way that is more effective um, that you know, ultimately you want to be able to have jobs, yeah. uh, but that also requires policies on the whole mm -hmm. community. And I just end with the plea and the reminder that we really do need to focus on the prevention issue of the prevention of the kinds of crises and the kind of um, violence that is driving this surge um, of refugees globally, and that has we we just have to keep that in focus yes. as a part of the conversation. Great point, thanks, uh, Eric. Um, I think there were three questions that were asked by two mm. people. Um, uh, there is no more important issue. There's no more important issue in which um, where leverage, where you can leverage a modest amount of resources to get the the greatest impact in terms of uh, humanitarian objectives than um, issues surrounding uh, women in international humanitarian response. I, I think the, the agenda of the, the women peace and security agenda I think is critically important uh, uh, of, of ensuring uh, that women are uh, um, uh, you know, uh, playing roles in, um, in humanitarian operations, uh, in peace building, in peacekeeping. Uh, when that happens, 
there are dramatic shifts in the way in which uh, the aid um, uh, is dispersed, uh, the way in which the, the programs uh, go forward. And, and so, you know, I think you, that, that, that Women, Peace, and Security uh, resolution from 2000 or 2001 is still, to my mind, a great roadmap for action. Uh, and I think um, there's much more that has to be done uh, uh, you know, on those sets of issues. Um, uh, uh, let me turn to the question on, on, refu on refugee um, work and refugee admissions. On refugee work, um, you know, I think the whole discussion of solutions, where's the person who asked the question? There the whole go. discussion, <laughs> this whole discussion of solutions, I think, is about creating um, more genuine opportunities for the kind of work uh, and education experiences that enable people to realize, um, to build human capital. I hate to put it in those terms, but that's what we're talking about because that's what a refugee has. That's the thing that a refugee can bring anywhere in the world. Um, and so, so, and I think the discussion of real solutions that recognize that as important as is prevention, there will be refugees. Um, I think, so I think there's, there's reason for hope and optimism on that. Um, on your question about refugee admissions, if I understood it correctly, I think that um, in the United States at least, traditionally, although it's changed a little bit in some of the language in this administration, traditionally we have had a refugee admissions program that was exclusively focused on vulnerability. And I think as long as you're talking about refugee admissions, refugee admissions, I think it, the focus should be on vulnerability, on what group of refugees need to be resettled. It's going to, always going to be a very small minority. Who, what group are in either protracted situations or dire situations or post-traumatic situations that their resettlement is critical in? And the reflection of that is increasingly in recent years, the United States has deferred to UNHCR in decisions about who will be resettled. And I think that's what the world should do. But your question gives me an opportunity to make a final point, um, which I think is the most fundamental point, which is that if you, want, if, if you don't want complexity, then build a wall and, and, and have that as your rhetoric. Have that as your rhetoric. But, but, but the answers to these, to, these, to these challenges are complex. Um, you know, should we return 200,000 El Salvadorans who've been in the United States for nearly 20 years? Um, because many of them would not you know, meet the refugee definition. They've been here as temporary residents. Of course we shouldn't. How could, you, how could you take the position that people who have been here for nearly 20 years and have developed stakes here you know, should be forced to go back to their countries of origin? But they're not going to be deemed to, they're not going to be, they're not going to be asylees. Um, what do we do about Central Americans who are fleeing violence and persecution? Um, and maybe they shouldn't have to go back to Central America. Um, but they're not, they, many of them may not meet the refugee uh, definition. What about Venezuelans who are here? Uh, should we force them back now? Um, you know, so, so the, the point I'm making is that, that complex situations don't beget simple solutions. And if, you, and if, and if you're going to be interested and involved in this area, you have to accept the fact that there are multifaceted um, and complex solutions. We have to work on prevention to deal with the, the source of conflict in Syria. But we also have to recognize that Syrians in Jordan need real opportunities. Does that mean they're going to be uh, Jordanian citizens? Well, we're not really talking about that now. We don't know. And hopefully, we expect most of them will go back. But there's ambiguity there. But if you're not prepared to live in that kind of ambiguity, in that kind of complexity, then, 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 then don't do policy. Don't, don't be engaged in policy. Because the answers are complex. And that's what makes it incredibly challenging. Because people want, you know, simple, simple solutions to complex problems, and they don't, they don't, they don't exist. Mm. Well, thank you so much. This was very enlightening, uh, Ambassador. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you will come back again. Anytime. <laughs> Nancy, always great to see you. Thank you for coming, and Eric, um, you are at home. <laughs> I am. Thanks so much. So I